It was a busy weekend around South Bend. The Irish landed a big commitment in football, but lost the veteran quarterback to the transfer portal, as well as a key piece from the men's basketball program. How it went down and what it all means coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome in. This is Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Tuesday, April 2nd, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and these days I'm a producer at Fox Sports. And you can watch today's episode and every other episode on YouTube, or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching along on YouTube, please like the video below and subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please remember to rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe if you have not already, because I promise you, it goes a long way in supporting the show, and I really appreciate everyone who's done so already. We got a bit of good news and bad news in today's show. The good news is that Notre Dame picked up their 19th commitment in the class of 2025 over the weekend in four-star linebacker Anthony Sacka, who picked the Irish over Ohio State, Alabama, and several others. The bad news is that veteran quarterback Clarence Lewis entered his name in the transfer portal over the weekend, as did freshman forward Kerry Booth from the men's basketball team. We're going to cover it all in today's show, but let's start with the good news. Let's start with some positive vibes on this Tuesday morning. Let's start with Anthony Saka's commitment. So he is the 19th commit in Notre Dame's top-ranked class of 2025, and I think this is a very important commitment for several reasons. First off, I think he's a really good player. He's got great size for a linebacker. He's listed as 6'3", 225 pounds, and he's a terrific athlete. He's been All-State since about his freshman season, and he plays against really high-quality competition. He's out of St. Joseph's Prep School in Philadelphia. That's the same school that guys like DeAndre Swift, Marvin Harrison Jr., and Rich Gannon, for those of you who remember him, he was a pro bowler once upon a time. That's where they all went to school, as well as Steve Vesteria, Notre Dame men's basketball legend. They all went to the same school. And if you look at uh, some of the, the programs that St. Joseph's Prep played last season, uh, it includes IMG Academy in the season opener. They also played Lakeland from Florida, which is a really good program, as well as New Jersey powerhouse Don Pasco Prep. Shout out to Spencer Scannell, their co-defensive coordinator. Um, but I think Saka is a really good player. He's produced at a high level going up against really high quality competition. And because of that, his ratings reflect that. He's a consensus four-star recruit. He's the number 25 linebacker in the class and the number 187 player overall, according to the 24-7 sports composite. Also, fun fact, his dad, Tony, played cornerback excuse me, quarterback at Penn State with Al Golden. uh, And that was a huge piece in this recruitment. Golden's relationship with the Saka family went a long way in getting him to commit to Notre Dame. And it actually reminded me about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago, is more so uh, the summer of 2023. A lot of people were saying that Al Golden couldn't recruit because Notre Dame wasn't landing some of the top prospects on defense like Justin Scott. And they wanted him gone because they weren't particularly thrilled with his first season as a defensive coordinator, and they didn't feel like he was backing it up on the recruiting trail either. Either way, I think we as a fan base have come a long way with Al Golden as the defensive coordinator, and his recruiting chops helped out in a big way here. Uh, He is the main reason why Saka committed to Notre Dame. Also, Max Bullard deserves a ton of credit. He was a big part in his recruitment as well, and I think that's good to see that Notre Dame's new linebackers coach is getting after it on the recruiting trail. So that's all good news, right? The second reason I think this is so important is because he picked Notre Dame over Ohio State, Alabama, and Wisconsin. He also had over a dozen other scholarship offers from some of the top programs in the country, but at at the end of it, it was really down to Ohio State, Alabama, and Wisconsin as well. Notre Dame has won several battles against Wisconsin on the recruiting trail and when it comes to hiring assistant coaches, but Notre Dame has not had a ton of success going up against Ohio State or Alabama on and off the field. And I'll admit that getting a player to commit to Notre Dame over Alabama doesn't have quite the same ring to it without Nick Saban as the head coach. And I know that Alabama started to pursue Sack a little bit more aggressively once Kalen DeBoer became the head coach there, but still it's Alabama, and any time you can get a win over them is a big deal. So I think this is a big, big commitment for Notre Dame. My only question about Saka is what position is he going to play in college? Because 
He's listed as a linebacker, but he actually mostly plays safety for his high school team. He's a very versatile player. He could play the Mike linebacker position. He could play outside linebacker. Hell, he could even play Viper, or he could play safety, which is, I want to say, his natural position because that's what he plays. But I think there are pros and cons to each argument. I think he makes the most sense at Will Linebacker because uh, he can move really well in space. He can cover. He can also blitz off the edge. So he can do a bunch of different things for you, which makes him such an intriguing prospect. Last season, he finished with 67 tackles and two interceptions, which might not be like the eye-popping numbers that you see from some recruits. But again, when you consider the quality of competition that he played against and also plays with, like there's some other really good players on this defense, I think that the context there is important and shows you that this guy is constantly making plays when he's out there on the field. So I think when he gets to college, he could play all over the field and his versatility is going to be an asset. This is just one of the situations where like, The player is so good that you just take him no matter what. And then you kind of figure out the position once he arrives on campus. Like I said earlier, he's 6'3", 225, and I think there's still plenty of room for him to grow physically. If they wanted him to to bulk up and play the Mike linebacker position, I think he could certainly do that. I think the idea of the Mike linebacker and the skill set that is required to play that position is obviously a lot different today than it was say like 10 years ago, because if you play any linebacker position, you are going to have to be able to cover. You're going to have to make, uh, be able to make plays in space, make open field tackles and run down really good athletes who are on offense. So I, I really am happy with this commitment. I hope that it, you know, calms down some of the concerns from the Notre Dame fan base about the caliber of players that Notre Dame has been adding lately Uh, I think when you look at the last four commits, they were all three-star recruits. And as for the class as a whole, Notre Dame now has 19 commitments, and eight of those are three-stars. The other 11 are four-stars. And right now, Notre Dame does not have a true five-star prospect committed in this class. So on one hand, I understand some fans. They look at the numbers. They look at the stars, and they're like, wait a second. I thought this Marcus Freeman era would be uh, or would lead to a lot higher rated recruits. And even though I think it has, and I think that recruiting under Marcus Freeman has definitely taken a step up. They're a lot more aggressive. They're in the mix for guys that they otherwise would not have been in the previous regime. This is one of those players who I think he's a much better prospect than some of the guys that Notre Dame has been getting. And I think that some of the fans who, if the only thing that they're looking at is the ranking and the stars, and they do matter. Okay. I don't want to hear anyone who says that stars don't matter. They do. But also I think that evaluation matters. And especially in the case of Notre Dame, getting guys who you want in the school and who can make it at Notre Dame, you have to be able to hit on some of those lower-rated three-star prospects who end up becoming really good players in college. I don't think that's the case with Anthony Saka. He's a really good prospect. He's a really good player, and I think the future is really bright for him at Notre Dame. Also, the last thing I want to say about Anthony Saka is this is another example of Notre Dame prioritizing the sons of former high-level players. Tony was a good quarterback at Penn State, and he actually was considering Notre Dame when he was coming out of high school, so he's familiar with the program, he's familiar with the university. This time, Notre Dame was able to land his son, Anthony, and there's just something about the 4 for 40 message that Notre Dame, uh, it just seems to resonate with those types of people who experience college football or pro football, and then they want the best future for their sons. This is clearly something that Marcus Freeman has prioritized. It's part of the strategy, and right now, it is really working for Freeman and his staff. Okay, coming up next, why Clarence Lewis's decision to enter the transfer portal might be a positive sign for Benjamin Morrison's health. Today's episode is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Speaking from my own experience, I know that whenever we're looking to make a new hire, we use LinkedIn to help find the perfect new team member, and it's so easy because they do the heavy lifting. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They've got a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. It's why owners rate LinkedIn jobs number one, delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Post a job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnCollege. That's LinkedIn.com slash Locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So now that we've covered the good news in today's show, we've got to talk about the bad news and honestly, the somewhat surprising news that happened over the weekend when cornerback Clarence Lewis decided to enter his name in the transfer portal. And to clarify, I wasn't really surprised by Lewis's decision to enter the portal, but I was surprised by the timing of it. 
Notre Dame is in the middle of spring practice. Now, they're in the midst of a week-long break between practices, but still, they're already in the thick of it, and cornerback Benjamin Morrison just underwent shoulder surgery that could keep him out for several months. That would mean, or at least I would think it would mean, there was an opportunity for Lewis Lewis to get a little bit more playing time, especially while Morrison is sidelined. Now, the portal is not open for undergraduate students until April 15th, but since Clarence Lewis has already graduated from Notre Dame and he's a graduate transfer, he can enter at any time, and he made the decision to do so last week. And I think when you look at Lewis and what he did uh, in his career, before we get into the impact of what this decision means for Notre Dame and the future of the quarterback room, I think Lewis's career was much better than I anticipated. He was a low three-star recruit coming out of high school, but then he earned playing time right away as a true freshman in 2020. I actually remember when Lewis had to be subbed in for Tariq Bracey, who ended up having a really good uh, finish to his career at Notre Dame. Lewis had to come in for uh, Bracey during the Clemson regular season game in 2020, which was like one of the biggest Notre Dame regular season games in a really long time because Tariq Bracey kept getting beat. And I thought, wow, like the staff already trusts him to come in in this kind of a game. Then he's going to have a really bright future. Hell, Brian Kelly started making comparisons with Lewis to Kavari Russell. And if you remember... Russell was a guy who wasn't even a quarterback coming out of high school. He was a running back and then had to make the transition over to cornerback during fall camp of his true freshman season because Notre Dame didn't really have any other options once Lowe Wood went out with a season-ending injury. Things were a lot different for the Notre Dame cornerback room back then compared to what they are now. But Lewis started six games uh, in that season as a true freshman, and I thought, you know, things were really looking up for Clarence Lewis. And even though things did not continue on that same trajectory, I think he's had a really solid career at Notre Dame now that it's all said and done. He finished with 124 total tackles, three interceptions, including a pick six last season against Tennessee State. He also had 18 passes deflected, a sack, and a forced fumble. His best season came as a true sophomore in 2021. That year, he had 54 tackles, four passes defended, one sack, and an interception. So things were looking really good for him. And then in 2022, Benjamin Morrison comes out of nowhere and beat out Lewis as a true freshman. And Lewis, or excuse me, Morrison wasn't even an early enrollee. He did that in fall camp. And I think That was shocking to a lot of people, but it was also a good indicator of how special Benjamin Morrison was and would end up being. But credit to Clarence Lewis because he stuck it out throughout that 2022 season, and he could have left after that year, but then he came back, played all throughout 2023, even though he was no longer a starter. And by all accounts, Lewis was a great teammate and certainly a valuable piece to the depth of that room. So now that we can focus on the Notre Dame uh, perspective on this, This definitely hurts the depth of the quarterback room. And yes, I totally understand that Mike Mickens has done a great job of adding more talented players, and he's added more depth to the position ever since he arrived on campus. But now that Notre Dame is without Benjamin Morrison for the foreseeable future, and now they lose Clarence Lewis's veteran presence, they're going to be playing a lot of young guys. And now there's obviously two ways to look at it. This is great for guys like Jaden Mickey, Christian Gray, Chance Tucker, and Micah Bell, because they're going to be getting a lot more reps. This is good for their development, but still that group is not necessarily a college football playoff caliber cornerback room. And you obviously have Jordan Clark at nickel. Uh, Micah Bell has been working at nickel as well, but so was Clarence Lewis. And I think Clarence Lewis's versatility and the fact that he's so experienced, he's been around for so long, just made him a valuable piece to have. Like if he stayed at Notre Dame, he was definitely going to have a role on this team. Probably not a starter, even if Benjamin Morrison ends up missing a few games. I don't think he would be that high up on the depth chart, but he'd still have a role. He'd come in in obvious passing situations, and I think that Notre Dame is definitely going to miss him next season. But you could also look at it from the perspective of, does this mean that Benjamin Morrison is a little bit healthier than we might have thought? And again, I kind of got some heat because when I first talked about Benjamin Morrison's injury on the podcast, I covered all the different options, like, I covered him coming back pretty soon, not missing any time at all, really, not even in fall camp, him missing a little bit of time at the start of the season, or it's starting to linger and go into the 2024 regular season. Right now, I'm optimistic that he's going to be back, you know, sooner rather than later, and he's not going to miss that much time heading into August. But if you're Clarence Lewis and you think, okay, Benjamin Morrison is definitely going to be out for some time, wouldn't that mean you have more incentive to stay at Notre Dame? Because that's how I would look at it. 
Or he could look at Benjamin Morrison's injury and say, oh, he's going to be fine. He's going to be back here soon. And then he, uh, Clarence Lewis is going to have to be going at it against those young guys just to get some reps on the field on Saturday, even though he's not even going to be a starter. Like, that's a tough position to be in. And even though he's kind of dealt with it the past couple of years, I just feel like Clarence Lewis has proven enough at the college level that he does deserve to get some playing time somewhere. It's just not going to be at Notre Dame. So I think he's going to go out in the portal. He's going to find another school where he could probably start I mean, hell, he started, I think, 23 games in his career at Notre Dame, so we know that he's capable of being a starting quarterback. But it's just not really the place right now at Notre Dame, and I think Benjamin Morrison's injury and his recovery just got a lot more interesting because now that you lose a guy like Lewis, the depth is really hurt. But also, if he comes back, then the loss of Lewis doesn't really matter nearly as much. And uh, I think you still feel very good about the Notre Dame cornerback room going into the season. But best of luck to Clarence Lewis at his next destination, no matter where he ends up going. He stuck it out at Notre Dame, earned his degree, and uh, dealt with a lot. Was a good contributor when he was out on the field, and I think he's definitely a capable starter. So I'm excited to see what the future holds for him. All right, coming up in segment three, Notre Dame men's basketball is likely going to lose one of its foundational pieces from its freshman class. Where does Michael Shrewsbury go from here? That's next. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Notre Dame men's basketball also got some bad news in the past few days when freshman forward Kerry Booth uh, became the third men's basketball player to enter his name in the transfer portal on Monday. And of all the guys who have put their name in the portal so far, this one definitely hurts the most. Matt Zona and Alex Wade entered the portal about a week and a half ago, and I think everyone expects Tony Sanders Jr. to do the same, even though he has not announced it yet. But those three probably aren't considered key pieces for the future of this program, but that is not the case with Kerry Booth. He is one of the most important pieces of this young Notre Dame core. And he did say that he's not ruling out a return to Notre Dame, but I wouldn't count on it. The vast majority of guys who enter the name in the transfer portal, they end up leaving. So I'm not really counting on Kerry Booth ever playing another game in a Notre Dame uniform. And this is a big loss for Notre Dame. Booth was a top 50 prospect coming out of high school, and he actually followed Micah Shrewsbury from Penn State to Notre Dame as a high school prospect. He was initially committed to Penn State, and then when Shrewsbury decided to come over to Notre Dame, uh, Kerry Booth followed him there. Booth is a great athlete for his size at 6'10", and he's one of those guys that just has the combination of size and athleticism that Notre Dame really struggled to land under Mike Brace. So when Shrewsbury came over and they... Uh, we're able to bring Booth with him. You're like, okay, this is a glimpse into the future. Like these are the guys that Notre Dame needs to have success. You need to have that kind of size. You need to be able to move. And Booth was sort of one of those guys that you could sort of build your program around. He's also very young. He reclassified, uh, reclassified and technically could still be a senior in high school right now. And I think because he's so young, he's still a very raw developmental prospect. And that's a big reason why he came off the bench for the first 11 games of the year. But Even though he came off the bench for the first 11 games, Booth appeared in all 33 games that Notre Dame played this season. He averaged 6.1 points per game and 4.5 rebounds per game in about 20 minutes of action per game. But by the end of the year, you could really start to see the flashes of Booth's potential. Uh, I remember a dunk he had in that in that two game that was really good, and it was really exciting. I mean, he scored ten or more points in three of the last six games, and he had improved as a rebounder. And you're like, okay, you're starting to see it a little bit. He still has a long way to go. He's not anywhere near his full potential, but it was one of those things that, despite a really rough season for Notre Dame in the win loss column, you could see the development from a lot of these young guys. And you're like, look, at least some of these losses they're going to end up paying off because the guys who are out there, the guys getting experience, this is going to pay off down the road, but unfortunately, it doesn't look that like Booth's payoff is going to happen at Notre Dame. So a lot of people were surprised by this decision, and as for the reason for his departure, 
All I could say is that I started hearing rumors that Booth might put his name in the transfer portal a few weeks ago. I wasn't sure if he would actually go through with it because I felt Booth would be loyal to Shrewsbury considering he followed him from Penn State to Notre Dame. And I thought given Booth's dad and his connections, uh, his Booth's dad is the general manager for the Denver Nuggets. And um, like Mike, or like Marcus Freeman, Michael Shrewsbury has prioritized recruiting guys who uh, come from great basketball pe- pedigree. Um, Sir Muhammad is also the son of an NBA executive. So there's definitely a pattern there. And I think that the Notre Dame message, like it does in football, also resonates in basketball. So I thought, oh, like the son of an NBA general manager, who's also a really good prospect, like he's perfect for Notre Dame in this new era under Micah Shrewsbury. But it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case. In the end, I think it just had to do with Booth's desire to get more playing time. I think in his mind and the people around him, Booth deserved more than 20 minutes per game uh, than he was getting, and now he's looking to get that elsewhere. And it happens. Um, even though you could kind of make the case that, hey, you're the future of this program, you're going to be getting a lot more time, sometimes it just doesn't always resonate, especially when you've got coaches from all around the country at every single school constantly trying to pry away players. It's just the reality of the sport. So, Before Booth put his name in the transfer portal, I felt like Notre Dame absolutely needed a veteran post player. Now they need two, right? They need another guy. They need two guys down there who can play down low because Keba Jai still has a long way to go. And now that you lose Booth, that's just a lot of minutes to make up. And this is definitely an unfortunate loss for Notre Dame. But like I said, it's a reality in the modern game. And now we get to see kind of how Micah Shrewsbury responds. We're also going to get a glimpse of just how aggressive he is going to be in the transfer portal because similar to football, basketball has their issues getting undergraduate transfers into Notre Dame. Now with a guy like Booth gone, how is Notre Dame going to be able to recover from that? One thing that Notre Dame can do when it comes to adding undergraduate transfers is getting guys who just finished their freshman year because it's a little bit easier to get guys in academically after they do that. But I think Notre Dame as a whole has definitely shown strides of improving that and making that process a little bit easier to get guys in from the transfer portal. I mean, look at uh, Riley Leonard and Bo Collins. Like They had not even graduated at their schools yet, and they were able to transfer into Notre Dame despite the fact that they had been in college for several years. So this offseason is going to be like a big case study for Micah Shrewsbury's strategy towards the transfer portal, and now he has no choice but to be extremely aggressive. Like last year, Kind of gave him the benefit of the doubt because it's just a really hard pitch to get any transfer to come to Notre Dame knowing what the rebuild was going to be like. And we all experienced it last year and saw how difficult it was for that team. But now that you've got a good core in Marcus Burton and Braden Shrewsbury and you've got a guy like Keba Jai who definitely has some potential. If Notre Dame and Micah Shrewsbury can um, recruit some guys in the transfer portal to come to Notre Dame and be effective early, give them some playing time that they might not otherwise get at the school that they went to, or if they're at a smaller school, this would definitely be a step up in terms of the stage and competition, then Notre Dame could field a good team next year. But one of those things is like when you when you have a new coach and you have a really tough rebuild process like it's rarely ever a straight line you think you're making progress and then you deal with a setback that sets you back a little bit further but I feel very confident in Michael Shrewsbury that he's going to be able to make up for this loss and continue to build a competitive team I'm not ready to say that they're going to make the tournament next year I know that Tom Noy men's basketball beat writer came on this podcast at the end of the last week and said there's no chance it happens I'm not ready to go that far but I think it got a little bit harder today because of Kerry Booth's decision again He still might come back. I highly doubt it. And uh, it's just another step in what is going to be a very important offseason for Micah Shrewsbury and the Notre Dame men's basketball program. That's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making Locked on Irish your first listen of the day. Be sure to tune in to tomorrow's episode. We're going to have Luke Smith back on the show, so I'm really excited about that. Plus, the mailbag returns on Friday of this week, so get your questions in. Remember... You can drop them below in the YouTube comments or send them in on social media uh, on X at Locked on Irish or on Instagram at Locked on Irish Pod. Also, please subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts, and I'll see you tomorrow.